All right, let's get going. Because we're going to answer exam questions. All right. But well, we're not going to answer the actual exam questions. But we're going to talk about the exam is coming. You can run, but you can't hide. It's coming next Friday night at 7. What better way to kick off your weekend than uh, the exam? And then it's only two hours, 9 o'clock. Eat something. Go to Jones Inferno. And you're going to have a great weekend. Don't have it too great a weekend because I don't want to get involved. Um, so you will soon get an email telling you what room uh, you're in for the exam. It's a disaster. There's a debate tournament on campus. We're going to be in five rooms for the exam. So look carefully. You'll get a list. It'll be alphabetized, alphabetized by last name. Don't get excited. I've done seven rooms. So this is near a record. Um, the equation sheet. Everybody's curious about the equation sheet. Will we have an equation sheet? Yes. An early version was posted. We decided to organize it a little bit. So if you go to the exam tab, and then you go to formula sheet. This is the thing that will be stapled to the back of your exam. You'll have your own personal copy. You don't need to print it out for yourself. Here it is. I slapped it out really fast. So if you want to look at it, and if there's a mistake on it, that'd be a real disaster. But I think, uh, I believe it's all accurate. Um, and notice that one thing about equation sheets is, you know, we don't have time to write every little comment about the equations, about the notation. They're meant a little bit, you know, you have to understand what the equations mean. And my example is, we did 1D kinematics and 2D kinematics. And in the book, 1D kinematics was all called S. Somebody was asking early on, is S the same as X? And I said, yes, S is the same as X. But I don't want to call it S on the equation sheet because S is arc length. Right? So I just called constant acceleration kinematics, I just wrote it in terms of X. Does that mean those equations don't apply in terms of Y? No, they apply for Y. Right? So I just gave it to you, X equals X naught plus V naught T plus 1 of AT squared at X but that's also true for Y, or R, or S, or whatever. So the point is, this isn't like a textbook. This is just to remind you how the equations work, OK? I'm not saying there will always be acceleration in X. I'm just giving you the general equation. And you can apply it in Y and whatever else you want to apply it in. Uh, you know, vector notation also, if it doesn't have a hat on it, it's a magnitude. Remember, friction forces, we don't write this with a vector hat on it, because those are different directions. We're just giving you the friction magnitude. You have to know the direction. We're not telling you everything with this equation sheet. I think that was the main caveats I wanted to put about the equation sheet. So, you know, use it. It'll help. You don't have to memorize all these things, but realize that you've got to think a little bit when you use it. Right? It's not just everything you need to know will be on the equation sheet. So I'd encourage you to look it over, make sure you know what those equations mean is one way to study. And if you find a mistake or a typo, please tell me. Because <laughs> we don't want to take an exam with an incorrect equation sheet. Okay. All right. You will have a copy of that. Uh, the exam structure, I just thought I'd tell you the way an exam works is you'll have two hours. It'll be eight multiple choice questions. That's one part. And it'll have three free response questions. And, you know, each one is like A, B, C, D. It's supposed to be A is kind of the easier part, and then it gets harder as you go. So when you read it, don't just read A and say, yes, read the whole thing. Of those three free response, you only have to do two. We will only grade two. So you look at them and you decide, I'm strong on these topics. I'll do these two. Okay? Don't do all three, because then we just have to guess which two to grade. On the front of the exam, you circle which two you want graded. Okay? So if you happen to mess around with all three, but you liked your answer on two of them, tell us which two to grade. Don't make us guess which two to grade. This is all written in very clear instructions on the front, which, of course, no one will read. So I'm telling you now. Only do two, and we will only grade the two that you tell us to grade. Okay? So what that means is, in terms of the grade on the exam, it's really one-third is multiple choice, one-third is the one free response you did, and one-third of the grade is the other free response. So you can do that to decide, think about your time. Probably spend a third of your time on the multiple choice, and a third on each free response. Um, the exam is going to cover everything through, you know, this week. And the best place to review that of what we're really going to cover. There's two places. One is in the schedule. So you've probably seen the schedule of what we're covering. If you're really obsessive about the readings, you've been looking through this. I'm going to go through these sections and update them. There you know, a few things we left out or we skipped or we added, decide we're important. So by Friday night, I will go through and remove the sections that aren't relevant here. It's pretty much accurate right now, but I will fix it. So if you want to know exactly what sections the exam covers, it'll be whatever's listed through week five here. Okay? 
If you want to go through the skills, that would also be useful. These posters, all that stuff has been copied down here during the skills checklist, right? So week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. So I would take this, I'd make a game, print them out, put them in a hat, and draw one, and say, do I, can I do motion problems involving reference frames? Am I good at finding force components, calculating the net force, and solving kinematics problems, right? You could turn it into a water drinking game if you want, and play all weekend. Great way to study. Um, also keep in mind the dot, dot, dot. So maybe the pledge problem lets you see what the dot, dot, dot means. That's where we, you know, we're not saying, we're just going to do exactly what we've done in the homework. We'll give you a little wrinkle to see if you really understand. So the pledge problem, the example of that was there was acceleration in the X. Can you do kinematics where you have acceleration both ways, right? That's all it really was. That was the wrinkle on that problem. I think everybody was decent with that. There was another wrinkle, but one person was incapacitated and hasn't taken it yet, so I don't want to say the second wrinkle. But next week, I'll tell you the second wrinkle if you want to know. Um, let's see, topic, skills, list. The next thing says, find at random dot, 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 example from pledge. I don't know what that means. Um, the next thing says, oh yeah, we're going to post last year's exam. So you can look at last year's exam. We'll post a solution to last year's exam. So you can use that to study as well. We're actually going to post both exams because we've changed the schedule. Now we're going faster than last year. We're covering kinematics uh, mechanics a little less. So last year's first exam doesn't have rotation on it. So we're going to give you the second one so you can look at those kind of problems. And then if you want more to study, so you've got, you can go over the homework, the Canvas homework, the suggested problems in the book, uh, the pledge problem, last year's exam. And if you want more, just take the back of your book and start doing problems. Right? The odd numbers have the answers in the back. You can come ask us at office hours. So if you bought the book, which hopefully you did, you got a huge number of problems in the back of the book. Those are better than those online sources. Those are confusing. So now, are there any questions about the exam? Uh, so how valid are last year's exams? They should be facing a lot of questions. Well, last year's exam is very valid because it was the same team teaching the class. The same team that wrote last year's exam is going to write this year's exam. If you go two years back, it was almost the same team. Not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. a review, oh, a special review session. That's a good idea. We should do that. Uh, I didn't think to schedule, yeah, because we usually, we're, the homework session will be Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, let me figure that out quickly. I'll see if we can find somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have an error carried forward policy? Error carried forward? Oh, yeah, that's how the graders uh, grade. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so they, they do their best to, to grade that way. So if you make a mistake on part A, they'll grade part B as though part A is correct. Or it's sort of a judgment call, usually. So, yeah, we grade very carefully. Spend half a day with a bunch of people. All right, what else? Yeah? Is there a curve? No, the curve is at the end of the semester. So your grade is your grade. At the end of the semester, we might have to curve. Oh, maybe these are exam questions. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so somebody's asking, will, there, will you need equations based on derivations of those equations? Yeah. So we're not just going to ask things that are the left side of every one of those equations. Uh, what's with a paparazzi? Oh, no, that's, don't worry about that. That's, <laughs> it's a human interest story, and it's not about me. I mean, I'm not going to have trouble staying off camera because you know how I am. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> um, Will everything on the second exam be posted on this exam or just the rotating? Just the rotating stuff. Can we use pen and pencil? I don't know how else you're going to do it without a pen and pencil. <laughs> do we need to know uniform motion? <laughs> do we need to know uniform motion? Non-uniform motion. I mean, yeah, that's acceleration in the Y is non-uniform. And on the pledge, we gave you acceleration in the X. We could do that again. So yeah, non-uniform. If you mean non-uniform circular motion, we haven't really done much of that just in the sense of a constant alpha. So don't, don't panic about that. Will we get the pledge problems back before the exam? Maybe. We'll post a solution for sure. But it's just how fast can the graders grade? That's the question. So yeah. But we will definitely put out the, um, uh, the solutions. Do you know the approximate test average of last year? No, it's, they're always in the 70s, always. Um, can we use a graphing calculator? Dr. Stenson, what is the calculator policy? I forgot. Yeah, so yes, you can use a graph. Just no internet-connected calculator, let's just say. Graphing won't help you, that's fine. 
Okay? So we're trying to tell you everything now because I know you're going to study this weekend. So that's why I was trying to get all this out now and not just wait till next Thursday, the day before. Yeah. Uh, so for the pre-response questions on the test, is yeah. the problem like logarithms or maybe on the uh, I mean, it's, they always have that many parts, but just the parts might be a little quicker okay. than the pledge problem. Yeah. It's very hard for us to gauge. It's like 80% as hard as a pledge problem because people find things so differently harder, if that's the right word. On average, I would say the exam problems have to be easier than the pledge problem because you have to do so many. Yep. Uh, it's on the equation sheet. I actually gave you G on the equation sheet. Yes. Torque, oh yeah. Yeah, everything from this week's on the exam. Gravity, the whole thing. The only thing that won't be on the exam is what we'll talk about on Tuesday. And then next Thursday is open to review. So you're going to get a survey soon about a lot of questions about the class. It's that point in the semester. So one of them will be, what should we do on Thursday? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more? I mean, you can email me questions. If you email me a brilliant question about the exam that I think everybody needs to know, I'll post it on Canvas. So if you come up with a question later, just email me. But I think we're good now. Okay. Don't worry about it yet. At least wait till the weekend. What were we doing? Let's see. We were uh, talking. We were talking about talk, as my Yankee professor used to say. So we were looking at Newton's second law for rotation. And we said, OK, well, it's just the sum of the torques equals something related to mass times angular acceleration. And we said, that can't be mass, because we thought about the units, and said, oh, this must be a new rotational kind of mass. You could call it rotational mass. But that's a little bit of a weird word. That's just something I made up. That's not like a real word. It's just sort of the, the mass you use, the thing that resists motion uh, when something is turning. It's really called the moment of inertia. So I think we got this far last time. We're at the moment of inertia I in kilogram meters squared. So you can immediately see that it has something to do with the mass, but it also has something to do with some position. And what it has to do with is um, I depends on the mass and how it is distributed. Distributed, and here's the per important part, around or about what? An axis of rotation. How is distributed about an axis of rotation? Therefore, if somebody ever says to you, what's the moment of inertia of this? You can say, that's a stupid question. Because you didn't tell me the axis. Right? Objects do not have an inherent moment of inertia. They only have an inherent moment of inertia about different axes. This has many moments of inertia. There's this axis, there's this axis. Every object has infinite moments of inertia because it has all these different axes it could possibly be moving around. Okay? So you have to define both the object, its mass, its shape, and how it's distributed around um, a specific axis. Okay? So to prove that to you, we're going to spin my three disks here. And now that these things are falling apart, we're going to watch the video of it. But basically, it's three of my favorite scientists, and they all are this. This is uh, Faraday. Greatest scientist that ever lived, right there, Faraday, Michael Faraday. If you think it's somebody else, you're wrong. It's Michael Faraday. I'll tell you why next semester. Mary Curie, only person to win a Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry. I also like her descendant, Sherry Curie, from uh, The Runaways, but I'm not sure they're related. And then, of course, Carl Sagan. Who has watched the, uh, what's that, Neil deGrasse guy? Have you all seen his Cosmos? Yeah, maybe. Go watch the 1980 Cosmos. It's just, as, actually, it's better. It's really good, Carl Sagan. So what we're going to do is these uh, little known fact, all these scientists had the same mass. They all weighed the same. They all clocked in at about, you know, one, whatever, something. But here we're going to spin them, and we're going to see that uh, they spin at different rates. Let's see, I already have it up somewhere here. La, there it is. We're going to watch them spin. So what we've got here is all three scientists on a disk, and we have a string around the disk, and we have the same weight on each one, the same mass. I think it was 100 grams or something. So in terms of torque, they all are the same because they have the same radius, r, and we've calculated torque a lot. We have the tension here. 
right? So then the torque would be the angle's 90 degrees, we're not going to do it in detail, is the radius of the disk times the tension, which isn't quite mg because it's accelerating and we don't want to do the kinematics right now. But the point is they all have the same torque, okay? So we're going to play and watch and we remove the rod and see what happens. So here we go, pull the rod and, oh, we got Faraday go! Sagan, with all the gravitas, goes the slowest. But they all have the same mass. How is that possible? How is it possible? And the answer is you look at the back. And of course the answer is they have different moments because their mass is distributed differently, right? So here is Faraday. All of his mass is near the center. Oh, we don't want to watch this idiot talk here. Let's turn, Let's turn that off here. So all of uh, his mass is near the center. And uh, if we then, the next fastest person was, um, yeah, the next fastest was who? Was Curie. Next fastest was Curie, and that's because her mass is a little bit further out. And then the slowest was Sagan, because his mass is really far out. Right? So they have the same mass, it's just farther and farther from the axis. So that would mean that if you get farther and farther from the axis, this must get bigger, because this is getting smaller. Right? They have the same torque, more uh, moment means less angular acceleration. All right. This is confusing, and there, here's the reason. Okay, the reason has to do with these two things here. All right. So we often have good intuition for translational kinematics and bad intuition for rotational kinematics. And the reason is, you know, we evolved hunting prey, right? So the thing's running there, and you throw a rock at it, and you get to eat it. Very little prey, like, spins around in a circle, okay? So there's proof, like look at these you know, football players. This guy is over here, throws a ball 60 yards in a trajectory. Another guy is running in a different frame of reference, jumps from his frame of reference into his own trajectory in his own frame of reference, and it makes it land in his hand. That's a pretty good intuition for translational kinematics, isn't it? I am trying so hard to be a normal person. It's like, I, just, I, I really try. And I was gonna join the dad's club at my kid's school. It's like, I'm gonna be a normal dad. And the very first event is they went to the Houston Gun Club to shoot trap and skeet. And I was like, well, you know, I'm from the country. I have shot trap and skeet before, but not usually with people. I don't know their mental stability. You know, I don't really like to <laughs> handle live shotguns with people like that. So I didn't join it and I feel horrible. But it's because you're good at translational kinematics is why people are good at trap and skeet. Let's think about how good people are at rotational motion, right? All you got to do is spin the stupid thing and make it land like right here. How hard is that? You say, well, you don't know how slow the wheel slows down. Well, you do it like 20 times during the show, and by the end of the show, they're no better. None of us could sit here with this wheel and spin it and say, oh, I'm going to make it land here. Right? It's totally random. It's because we're no good at circular motion. We're good at translational motion. So what we're trying to do here is like build up your intuition for circular motion. And this is the first thing, is that the rotational mass um, depends on how the mass is distributed. Uh, so of course, we'd like to build up your intuition, but more useful is we're just going to tell you how to calculate it. That's actually where you're going to get your grade from. Although intuition might help a little bit. Let's see. Let's get some lights here. So we're, now we're going to calculate this thing called the moment of inertia. So let's calculate. It's often, you know, when we're being cool, we just call it the moment. Moment for point mass. All right. Okay. So let's see, so let's imagine that we have like a big barbell here, like this, this is very familiar to me here, like that, right? All these giant things you lifted and the thing bends, it's so light. And the length of the thing is L, and these are huge masses here, right? And the bar is light, right? The bar doesn't weigh much. If you're not given the mass of something, it either is so light you don't consider it, or it's going to cancel. Hint, hint, pledge problem. If you're not given the mass, just put M. It'll probably go away. Um, so we want to calculate the moment of that thing. So can I just start calculating the moment? No, because I've not given myself an axis of rotation. Let's calculate the moment around here. Let's make this the axis, like into the board. Right. So in that case, since these are discrete masses, we can treat them as just point particles. Okay, we'll do examples where you don't just treat them as point particles later. But for now, it's just two masses. And you just use a formula. Uh, the moment I is the sum over all the masses of the mass times its radius or its position squared. 
So that looks kind of ugly and weird, but it's just saying add each one up. So the fundamental thing to know is that the moment of a mass is the mass times how far away it is from the axis squared. It goes as distance squared. That's why the unit is kilogram meters squared. So if we wanted to get this moment, we'd say I, the moment, is the first mass, M, big M, times this R squared, L over 2 squared, plus, I'm just getting started, okay, whatever, <laughs> plus this mass, it's big M, uh, times its distance, L over 2 squared. All right. So the answer is m times l squared over 4 plus m times l squared over 4, m times l squared over 2, because the 2 1 fourths uh, add up. 1 half ml squared is the moment for those two masses. So I'd say the only thing confusing about that is well, but one is in the negative direction, one is in the positive direction. So the thing to know is mass is a scalar. It is not in any way a vector. It doesn't depend on direction. Okay. Mathematically, it even works out. You could put a negative in there if you want, but you're going to square it. That's, that's your mathematical hint that the direction probably doesn't matter. If you put a negative sign in, it wouldn't matter. It'd still come out squared. So, but you might say, well, then shouldn't the side it's on affect the angle of the direction it goes? No. There's no vectors here. We're not doing kinematics. We're just calculating the moment. We're just calculating how some number related to how the mass is distributed around this axis. This 1 half ml squared applies if you rotate it this way or if you rotate it this way. It doesn't really matter. It has nothing to do with gravity or anything like that. Okay, so don't worry about which side is positive or negative for moment. For torque and everything else, of course, it matters. Right? But for moment, it's special. It's just a property. Um, if you want intuition for this, you take one of these. See this? This is a rod with a heavy mass um, at the bottom. Right? And I'm going to try to rotate it around here, this axis. And to do that, I have to use my hands. I'm really applying a friction force, a torque, around this little part to try to make a big enough torque to lift the whole thing and try to get it all the way up to hold a static torque. And it's like I can almost do it. I can't quite get it up. It don't quite go all the way up. I'm not strong enough, okay? I have a physique that can only be achieved through a lifetime of not lifting weights, okay? <laughs> I should be studied for that. Um, but if I put the mass here, now, even I, oh, easy, right? Look at that. Be impressed. Yes. There you go. Yes. So what I've done is I've changed R from the full length, L squared, not just L, L squared, down to just some teeny, like a tenth of L squared. And then it's easy to turn, okay? Now, if you're smart, how many of you are smart? That bad, huh? Okay, so <laughs> if you're smart and, you know, you got some really strong people making fun of you, and they're like, oh, I bet you can't torque this and rotate it, and you're, you can't, right? All you do is this. You didn't say the axis, right? <laughs> there you go, I can turn that, right? That's another case where we gotta think about how the mass is distributed around the axis. If you go with this axis, then all this heavy mass is even closer than when I had it up here next to this axis. It's really close right here. So that's why it's easy to turn this way. It's just hard to turn this way. Uh, and it's hard to turn this way. Oh, I'm a little better at that. If you want to play during the five minute break and get a feel for this, you can play with these. You could even take these to a party if you want. Like one has all the mass here and one has all the mass here. So it's very disorienting. Yes, so play with those. I don't know. I'd never seen those before. Somebody gave it to me right before class. So I'm not sure what to do with those. Like if you're gonna fight with them, I'm not sure which one it's better to have. Maybe y'all can figure that out. Okay. So that is the simplest idea for moment. If you just have point masses, it's just mass times how far it is squared. Then you can get into the moment for, uh, I'm going to say uniform shapes. Or I'll say uniform, uh, yeah, I'll say shapes. It basically means solids, solid objects, right? So. A solid object has mass distributed around it, and you can imagine probably the way you would calculate the moment is by uh, treating that solid object as a bunch of little masses and getting their moments and adding them up. And you know what that's going to lead to. Oh, you have to do an integral, right? Oh, oh, I saw a perfect reaction. Oh, it's perfect. Um, so we're just debating in this class, do we want to do that or not? It's sort of an engineering thing. 
even when we do it for the engineers, we just give them the formulas for the standard sizes and shapes anyway. So right now I'm just going to give you the standard formulas. And they are insightful. Here's a ring, a thin ring, thin ring. We're all, and we're looking at uh, this axis along here, around the axis. For a thin ring, all of its mass is at the same radius. It's like a series of particles all at R. And if one particle is mR squared, then this one just must be mR squared. There's no, like, all, all the answers are going to be something times mR squared. But that one is just mR squared, because basically all the mass is at R squared. Oh, oh my god. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I missed a bunch of questions. It's not making noise. Okay. Um, so that was a ring. I'll answer these later. Now let's look at another shape. The most important shape in any physics class is a disk. All right, so let's look at the moment of a disk. Uh, there we go. So a disk has some thickness like that. It has some radius r and some mass m. And maybe right away you can guess, is it going to be bigger than mr squared or is it going to be smaller than mr squared? It's going to be smaller because all the mass isn't at r. Some of the mass is close to the axis of rotation, which is again like there. So it's 1 half mr squared. We could do a big integral in 3D to get that. Trust me, it's 1 half mr squared. Um, uh, let's see. So let's look at uh, a cylinder. Mmm, like this. Ooh, look at that. A cylinder through that axis going around, as you would expect. Now it has height h and radius r and mass m. What is the moment? You could print it on the cylinder because it's bigger. It's also 1 half mr squared. It's the same thing. The height doesn't matter. Okay? Because here, the mass is distributed in a certain way around this axis. Here, it's the same. It's distributed a certain way around the axis, and the same fraction is close, and the same fraction is far. And where it is in this direction is irrelevant, because that is uh, along the axis direction. Right? So it's where it's distributed really perpendicular to an axis. It doesn't matter if the mass is spread along the axis or not. Okay, so if you ever have a problem with a big, long cylinder, realize, oh, it's the same as a disk. Okay, they're the same thing. No difference. Um, let's look at a rod. Uh, here we go. A thin rod. And if we go through the center of the rod like that, and the rod has a length L like that and mass M, it is 1 twelfth ML squared. Why is it so low? Why is it a twelfth? Because we're calling it in terms of L and not radius is part of the reason. See, everything else is a radius. This actually has a diameter. So if you call this L over 2, then the 12th wouldn't be so big. So that's the only reason there's a big 12 there. Right? Again, we could do an integral to get that, but I'm just telling you. Okay? Um, and then the sphere. We could do an integral in spherical coordinates. It's online if you want to watch me do it. And I screwed up on purpose for educational purposes, but I really screwed up on accident, and then I made a second video. So if we had a uh, sphere of radius r, big mass m, the moment, and you need this for the homework, is 2 fifths mr squared. How do we get 2 fifths? Well, it's a bunch of integrals and spherical coordinates. Let's see if any of these are answerable at this point. The subscripts and the formula for inertia, yeah. So these i's, this is like if we're adding up a bunch of masses. So this was i equals 1, i equals 2. Really just add up all the masses, just like we added them there. That's what that subscript was. Is L a vector? Uh, no. So in this case, L is just this distance. And since we're going to square it, we don't care about direction. So if you're asking if L is a vector, you're thinking about if the direction matters. And it doesn't. Right? Will the stick have bigger or smaller moment if the point mass than a, or less moment for a point mass than a skinnier stick? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Here, I was ignoring the stick. All right, so the stick is thin compared to this is really heavy mass. It's a really light stick. OK, so those are the fundamental moments. Should we memorize these for the exam? They're on the equation sheet. Ah, so you don't have to memorize them. Uh, well, we need how to know how to do integrals for the moment of inertia. It's not on the homework, and it wasn't on the pledge problem. So it might be in this lecture, depending on how fast we go. But yeah, we don't consider that a huge deal, so I don't think we're going to do that. Let's see. OK, so now what we want to do is see how we're going to use this information. 
Oh no, we want to do the, hmm, let's see. Uh, this first half has been fun enough. Let's save that for next half. So the, the second half is more fun. Okay, so what we want to do now, we can now do dynamics. We now have everything we need, right? We have some of the torques is I alpha. Now we know what I is. Now we can do dynamics. Let's do some dynamics. Um, let, oh, there's a bug. Um, let's look at the, um, I don't know what to call it, the light pulley Atwood machine. Remember, an Atwood machine is just two masses hanging off a pulley that accelerates slower than gravity. Okay? And I'm going to go through, actually, and do it real fast. It's really from like a couple weeks ago. But let's just do it real fast, just to remind ourselves how it works. So as a review is what I'm trying to say. So remember, we had M1, and it went around a pulley. This is a good way to draw a pulley like that. And we had M2. And it's just an ideal massless pulley. Right? It has no mass, so it really made the problem um, pretty straightforward. We said, well, M1 is greater than M2, therefore it's going to accelerate like that. That's going to accelerate down, that's going to accelerate up. And there's going to be some tension in the rope. And we told you that the tension will be constant. Right? As long as you don't apply a lateral force to a rope, the tension's the same all the way through the rope. And this led to basically two unknowns, two unknowns, and those unknowns were the tension and the acceleration. So this problem usually you would solve for tension and acceleration. And we had two equations. Right? And the two equations were F equals MA1, uh, the force of 1, and the force 2. So we could do it real quick, right? Because good review. Let's do it for review. Remember, you've got to get your directions right. Right, okay, so for mass 1, some of the forces on 1 equals the mass on the acceleration of 1. So that was tension was up, mg is down, minus m1g is down, equals what? Um, m1 and a, but we make it negative, because we're looking for the magnitude of a. Okay, so this is the magnitude of a. That's why I put in the negative. It's best to usually just work in magnitudes and put the negatives in manually, OK? So if that's just what you would do when you're fine, don't listen to the next one minute of talking, OK? You're exempt from the next minute. But if you worry about negative signs and what I'm talking about, listen. OK, you ready? You could say, I want to put in the component. I want to call this the vector component of A. Therefore, you make it positive, and you let the problem tell you which way it went, OK? You could want to do that, but if you do that, then you can't just say they're the same. Because if you do that, then they're going to come out in different directions. So then you've got to call this A1, and you've got to call this A2. Because maybe they're in different directions, and the component has to tell you that they're going different directions. So that would suck, because now you have three unknowns. What do you do now? Oh, the end of third equation, A1 equals negative A2. So there's your third equation. Okay? So you could do it with components and solve for components, but in most problems, it's better just to do magnitudes. So if you just do magnitudes, the, they have the same magnitude. This rope can't stretch. And you just put in the direction. Another reason to do magnitudes and manually put in the direction is whenever you're dealing with mg, you don't usually want to say, I'll consider g a component, and I'll let the problem tell me it's negative. You know it's negative. Right? And you know we mean g means positive 9.8, so you put in the negative. Okay, so most problems, it's better to go for the magnitude and put the negatives in. Some problems, you don't know which way it's going to go. If you're really lost, and I don't know if it's going to go up or down. I can't tell. Uh, this way is more. Maybe it'll go that way. Yeah, then you've got to do the components, I guess, to let the problem tell you. Okay. okay, now you can listen again if you weren't into that. Okay. So uh, if we, I don't, okay, so we don't want to do the algebra here. But we had uh, T minus M1G equals minus M1A. And here we had... Uh, for this one, it would be t minus m2g equals, and this one would be plus, because we know this one goes up, plus m2a. Two equations, two unknowns. Unknown, 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 unknown. And when you solve it, you get the answer for the simple uh, thing is that a is m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2g. So the Atwood machine does what it's supposed to do. It lowers the acceleration. If these two are almost the same mass, this number is small over this number that's big, slows it way down. If M1 weighs a lot more than M2, it doesn't slow it down much. Right? So this number minus this number is almost as big as that. It falls at almost G. Okay. 
Okay, so after the break, we will do the Atwood machine with a massive pulley. If you can wait. You, can you all wait or do we need to do it? You can wait five minutes because I know you're excited. Okay, let's wait five minutes. Okay, let's finish the Atwood machine here. So here we had a, uh, a regular Atwood machine where the, ma the pulley was massless. But then in a problem, somebody might also ask about the tension, right? So it might be solved for the acceleration, but then you may also be asked, what is the tension? So we've got to solve that as well. And uh, what you would do is you would have this numerically, and you would just plug it in back in this equation. Two equations, two unknowns. You have the value of one, you plug it back in the other. That's all you do. So in that case, the tension is reduced uh, when they kind of fall like that. Reduced? Let's see. Oh, I forgot. Let's see. What is it? It's, uh, if this weren't here, T would be M1G. But since that's there, yeah, it's reduced. The tension goes down. Because they're falling. Right. Yeah, they're falling. Um, OK, now, oh, OK, yeah, not that yet. Oh, I got that out too early. We'll play with that in a minute. Um, now we have to do with the whole point of this, this whole semester, this week, is a real pulley. Real pulley has mass. Has mass. OK, so let's solve this again. But now, whoops, I like to draw the heavier one lower, even though that doesn't really have to be that way. M1, M2, like that. And let's give the pulley M3, ooh, R, and give it a radius R. And ask the simple question, how fast is it going to go now? How fast will it accelerate if we let it have a mass? Hmm. And we're going to define up as the positive direction again, down as negative. We're going to rotate that disk. And we want to start labeling it. And we want to label it with some tension. So we say, OK, T here. But now we're going to lose the ability to say the tension is constant. Oh, the tension is not constant through the loop, the, uh, the, the rope now. Because uh, what happens is we have to now rotate something with a mass. So that takes a torque, and a torque requires a force. So the rope has to apply a force. So the rope applies a force to the disc. Has to happen. So the only way a massive disc can start turning. Here, the force it took to turn a massless disc is zero. Right? That's because it was massless. The hint I mentioned about the pledge problem was to the pledge problem you've already done. So if somebody's asking if we have another pledge problem, because I said I gave a hint. I meant to the one that's it's, it's not a useful hint, unless you have like a time machine or something. OK, so now that, what that means is the tension here is different from the tension here. So a rope, if it's a continuous rope and it's tied between two things, right? I told you it has a tension. It applies a tension to either side. So it always applies its tension to two places. That's still happening here. This rope is applying its tension to M1, and now it's applying it to the disk, because the disk needs a force to move. This one is applying its tension to two places, to M2 and to the disk. Therefore, we have to call them tension left and tension right. The tensions will not be the same if it goes around a pulley with a mass, unless it's frictionless on the surface. Okay? Pulleys are horrible because we say lots of stuff about them. They either have mass or they don't have mass. Fine. But then we might say it's a frictionless pulley. Does that mean frictionless here at the bearing, or does that mean the frictionless where the rope goes around it? Uh, it matters, right? Usually it means the bearing. We won't do a frictionless pulley, don't worry. Right? But you can imagine if the surface of the pulley were frictionless, then it's just going to slide over. It can't apply a force to it. There's, in, there's no such thing as a frictionless pulley. It's, it's a stupid concept. Let me not throw out confusing things. Let's just stop. OK. So how many unknowns do we have now? We don't know the left tension. We don't know the right tension. And we don't know the acceleration. So we have three unknowns. We better come up with three forces. Oh, I bet you we can. Let's see. Let's look at uh, this. We need three forces. So three unknowns. We need three equations. U-N-K. Unks. We need three equations. So let's look at mass one. The first two parts are just like before, except we don't just call it T. We call it TL. This has the left tension up minus M1G down equals, and this part's the same, uh, minus M1A. This acceleration we're looking for is just A, and we know it's down because we said M1 is heavier than M2. It's going to go this way. 
Okay. Let's see what this brilliant question is here. Can you explain again why the disk on the left diagram experiences no force? Because it has no mass. Right? M equals zero. So what force does it take to move something with no mass? Essentially no force. Right? Um, this one has a mass. Uh, let's see, so there's that one. And you may be wondering, are the A's the same? We made the tensions different. Are the accelerations the same? The accelerations are the same. Okay? So even though the rope is applying a frictional force to the pulley, it's still inextensible, right? It's still a rigid rope that can't be lengthened or whatever. So it's still true that if the rope moves some amount here, it has to move the same amount there. Therefore, the A is still the universal A. Okay? Let's look at the second one. Its equation, almost the same, except we use TR. Right? Same over there, except we use TR. So the right tension, TR up minus M2G down equals M2A plus M2A because it's going up. It's going to accelerate up. Do, do, do. That looks almost exactly the same as over here, except the tensions are different. So we need a third equation, and the third equation is the rotational part. So we've got to think about M3. Uh, M3. So we're going to apply Newton's second law, just like we were doing here, but we'll write it again since it's new. Some of the torques equals I alpha. Or T, uh, tau is the torque, I is the moment of inertia, alpha is the angular acceleration. Okay? So the torques, so in this case, a pulley is kind of easy because a pulley, it always pulls at right angles. Right? If a string leaves a circle, it has to do it tangential to the circle. You can't not do it tangential to the circle unless you bend the string, and then it's not a string. Okay? So a string pulling a pulley will always just be tension times a radius. Right? So the force is this way, the R vector is that way, add them tail to tail, 90 degrees, sine of 90 is 1, or it might be negative. It depends on which way it goes. Okay? So we could, let's get really advanced here, because you want to be able to do the problems kind of quickly. You don't want to have to write out every little thing. So let's do both torques in one fell swoop here. TL is making it turn in the positive direction. So that's probably the positive torque. TR is making it turn in the negative direction. So that's the negative torque. So if you want the net torque and you're really with it here, you can say TL minus TR times the radius of the wheel. Right, that's the net torque. Okay. We could draw all every vector. If you want to do every vector, come to office hours. We'll do it, vector at a time. And we could get the left torque, vectors, 90 degrees, theta's 270 or something crazy like that. Right torque, vectors. But if you're kind of realizing, oh, this is a simple case. Everything's 90 degrees. This pulls it that way, that pulls it that way. It might help your intuition to be able to just say, oh, difference in the tensions times R. Right. What is the moment of the disk? Hmm, let's see. I thought counterclockwise was positive. Uh, I, the way I wrote this is correct, so I probably said the wrong word. This is pulling it counterclockwise. That's why I made TL positive. I probably just said it backwards. I tend to do that. Don't listen to what I say and don't pay attention to what I write. So wouldn't TR be making it go in the... Yeah, I must have said it backwards, clearly. Why is TL pulling to the row? Oh, my goodness. Is this all correct? Let's see. <laughs> so I confused everybody on rotation. I must have said everything totally upside down. This is the left side because your finger, this finger makes an L. Okay? <laughs> if you do this and you want to know which one is left, it's the one that makes an L. I told George that when he was little, and he said, they both make an L. <laughs> Idiot. Um, this is the left side. And uh, if we just imagine, which way is this going to turn when we pull down? So the tension pulls in the direction of the rope when it leaves the circle. So it's pulling down. I was just saying if it's pulling down, it's clearly going to make it go this way. A clock hand goes that way. Right? So this is counterclockwise. TL counterclockwise. And we know that counterclockwise is positive. That's weird that we define it that way, but we do. Okay? So that's why this one is turning it positive. This one's turning it negative. I must have said it backwards and confused everybody. Sorry. I probably said it backwards. Yeah. Uh, why isn't R squared in the last equation I wrote? Because that's a torque. We haven't got to the moment yet. R cross F. Okay, I should have put the R on this side. It's normal to put the R on the left side. So but I put it on the wrong side, sorry. Now we're going to do the moment. What's the moment of a disk? One half M3, in this case, R squared. Just the formula for the moment of a disk. Right, nothing crazy. And then just to keep us trucking along, we're going to do another 
uh, baby step here, all in one equation. I'm going to make you do this like a, you know, like a really fast person would do it. We're supposed to write alpha there, but let's not write alpha. Because that's another unknown, isn't it? It's sort of like now we have a fourth unknown. We don't know alpha. But in these problems, you've got to remember alpha is always related to A, because we're talking about edge motion, right? As these things move up and down, their acceleration, and we have a string that can't be stretched, must be the same as the tangential acceleration of the disk. Right, let's write that down, because that applies to every problem. A, let's see, alpha is related to the AT of the edge of the disk, which equals a. You definitely want to understand that concept for any pulley or rotational problem with acceleration in it, or even without acceleration in it. Understand what I'm doing with this alpha, OK? I know this is accelerating at A. I know the string is accelerating at A. Therefore, I know the edge of the disk is accelerating at A, which we could call A tangential. I don't think we really use that much, but that's the idea. How fast is this uh, edge accelerating? So therefore, I have a relationship between these two. And then you think, oh my god, there's an r in it. I can't remember. Just remember s equals theta r. s equals theta r. Take a derivative. v tangential. What's the derivative of theta? Omega r. Take a derivative. a tangential equals alpha r. So if you forget where the r goes, just remember s equals theta r. The r goes on the angular part. So that tells us that the alpha that we're using is actually the tangential acceleration of the edge divided by r. At divided by r. But we know at is really just a. Right? So the whole point of that was just to write this in terms of a instead of alpha. Alpha is just a over r. That was fun. Um, and then you say, oh, there's no r's in it. Oh my god, look at this. That r cancels one of those r's, but then that one remaining r cancels that r. So the size of the pulley doesn't matter. You can make you be David Byrne and get a giant pulley. No, okay. <laughs> you just went to Sid 80s, and you got to know David Byrne's the guy with the giant suit, talking heads. No, okay. Uh, I'll tell Jennifer I tried. Let's see. So now we have our three equations and three unknowns, right? Uh, the left tension, the right tension, and the A acceleration. A, and what's left on this one? Oh, this is going to simplify down to not a whole lot left here. So T L minus T R, what's left? One half M three times A is all that's left. You could probably do the algebra for the rest yourself. Let's see. Uh, why does having a mass of pulley cause? Oh, it's a, hmm. Why does having a mass of the pulley cause the Atwood machine to have torque? It causes the Atwood machine to need torque. If you're going to turn that massive pulley, you have to have a torque. Has to, a torque has to be applied. The pulley can't just start spinning from nowhere. So the string has to apply the torque. How come the tension equals the torque? Oh, it doesn't. It's the tension times the r vector. Right? So that is really that tension really was r times f sine theta. I just skipped all that. Right? R is the magnitude of that. F is the torque. Is the net torque. And sine theta is all 90. That was where I said let's do this in one step and get you used to kind of moving faster. OK, so in the end, this is equal to that. And uh, now we just substitute. And then this gets down to wisdom. right? How do we want to substitute? I think I did it by putting these definitions of t into here. Right? So this was m1g minus m1a. Right? That's this tension. And then minus t right means this t right, and that comes over there as positive, but now it's negative again, minus m2g. And this side's positive, but it's minus, minus m2a equals 1 half m3a. That looks ugly, but now the only thing left is a. Right? We just eliminated t. So in the end, I'm not going to do the very ultimate final algebra. Solve that for a, and you get a equals something that looks almost the same, m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 plus 1 half of m3 times g. Okay. So just like the simple Atwood machine, here if m1 is bigger than m2, it drives the acceleration that way. It's 
not making it negative. Let's not worry about that. And uh, the bigger it is, the slower it's going to go. And here, M3, oh yeah, we solve for the magnitude of the acceleration. That's why it's not negative. And here, M3, what is it doing? It doesn't contribute really to the pulling force. It just slows it down. And because it's a, circ a disk, it doesn't slow it down as much. That's why there's the half there. The half is like an artifact from the fact that it's a rotational one half mr squared. Okay. Would the mass of the pulley usually be given? Uh, it depends on what kind of problem it is. I think in the homework I gave you this problem and it's numerical, so yeah. But I think the only thing now you have to do in the homework is go back to find the tensions, but I bet you can do that. Okay. Okay. So we are building up your intuition for rotation. So now we're going to build it up one more way. Uh, who thinks they can balance this comically oversized lecture pointer on their hand without letting it fall over? If you think you can do that, come down here. I want to see you do it. Surely one of you believes you can do this. Do we have any jugglers, any potential circus people here? I was either physics or I was going to join. Oh, yeah, come on down. Yeah, Let's see, potential circus workers. Okay, so take this and put the heavy part. I would suggest your whole hand, not your finger. Depends on how, how wild you feel. And see if you can balance that. Oh, shit, don't let it fall on the people. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you balance it. Wait, hold on. You balanced it for, we already know this guy, Hanson, and I don't have any more Hanson burns, so it's okay. Now, do it with that. Do it with a piece of chalk. Oh, you're terrible at it. Try again. All right. You can, I mean, chalk is shorter. Oh, my God. Can't do chalk. So why can he do this? Well, that's good, thanks. Why can he do this and he can't do chalk? Right? Because we have no intuition for rotational motion. You'd think the chalk would be easy, but it isn't. Oh, no. <laughs> no one has ever been injured in any of my classes, ever. It's never happened. Okay. Um, except me. <laughs> Uh, but you only die once, so you know, it's always worth it. Okay, so here's the reason. Let's think about the angular acceleration of what's really going on here. We have a really long lecture pointer here, and its length is L. And now let's say you're trying to balance it. What happens? It invariably starts to tip over. Okay, so you got your hand here. You got your lecture pointer here like this. It starts to tip over. So let's think about the forces. We say, well, some of the torques is I alpha. I took this fun activity and I'm turning it into a nightmare. Some of the torques is I alpha. We want to think about torque and moment. So what do we need? An axis of rotation, yes. I would put it here where the thing's actually going to rotate. So we're going to put the axis there. We want to think about this thing rotating off of your hand. So therefore, what is the torque? Well, we have a force mg down. We have a normal force up from your hand, basically. Uh, well. The good news is, if we put the axis of rotation there, we don't have to think about the normal force. Right? It gets canceled out, or the, the r vector is zero. But this one, okay, there's the r vector. Put your chalk on the axis of rotation and go here, and mg is down, right? And say it goes to, falls to some angle theta. Then uh, the torque due to that is L over two, right? That's the value of r. Um, the force is mg. And its component in this direction is sine theta. We don't need to do the trig again. Go back to last week. So there you go. It's like that. So that's the torque. Okay. Now, what is the moment of inertia of a rod from the edge? Oh, we're supposed to do the calculus part of the lecture to know that. I forgot. Um, hold on. Uh, it's one third ml squared. Okay. In the center, your formula sheet said it was 1 12th ml squared. That's because that's if you rotate it here. We're rotating on the end. So maybe you can imagine rotating a rod on, from the end takes is a bigger moment than in the center. Just rotate something heavy, and you'll convince yourself of that. Somebody asked, why is the normal force canceled out? It's not canceled out. Yeah, we could add it in. So the torque from the normal force is the r value, the distance, 0, times the force, n, times the sine of theta. It's because it has no... Uh, distance from the axis to where the force is applied. So it's not zero. It's not canceled. It's just, it's just zero. It applies. That's why I chose that axis. What does the mean? This is the axis of rotation, if that's what you're talking about. 
My x is sometimes mean axis of rotation. Why do we know it's exactly one third? Don't make me do calculus. Okay. So we could do an integral, and we might do that if we have time. If you're dying to see it, we can do it in office hours. But just the integral version of the getting the moment of inertia tells you it's one third. Okay, what all are we doing here? So we have all this junk equals, uh, all right, so there's I, there's the torques. But now we have to think about sort of the biological human element of this. What determines whether or not you can balance this or not? It's kind of like your reaction time, right? It starts to fall over, and my brain says, oh, we got to get under it, we got to get under it here, oh my god, right? So I have a certain reaction time. When I'm that spastic, it's maybe, I don't know, 100 milliseconds or something. So you got to be able to, to get under it when it starts to fall. So if you want to be able to uh, balance it, you need alpha to be small. Yeah, you need alpha to be small. Right? If it falls slowly, you can get back under it. If it falls fast, you can't get back under it. Right? So let's look at how alpha scales. So then we have alpha uh, equals, oh, I'm going to roll this out, um, L over 2 mg sine theta over 1 third ml squared. Right? Doesn't depend on the mass. What do you get over here? You get 3 over 2, and one of the L's goes away. 3 over 2 sine theta over L. Ah. So the angular acceleration is inverse to the length. Oh, right. So if something's long, if L is big, this goes really slow. And if this goes really slow, it's easy to get under it before it falls. If L is really small, the angular acceleration is so fast that I can't get under it. Right? And neither could he. It's okay. Nobody can do it. Well, some Cirque du Soleil person can probably do it, but most people can't do it. Okay? So there's your intuition. Now, do you believe that? See, here's what I love about the universe, is you always think you understand something, and it's like, no, it's more complicated than that, especially in biology. Uh, here's some good questions about how to do problems. Why is it L over 2? Because remember, this vector is from the point the force is applied, or the, the axis of rotation to where the force is applied, and the weight is applied at the center of mass, and for a uniform rod, the center mass is in the middle. So the length of that vector is L over 2. The rod is L, which I didn't tell you. Okay. Where did the G go? I don't know. I left it out. There you go. Here, I'll put it in this just to make it nicer for you. There we go. It's orange. Um, where did the one-third come from? That is the moment of a rod from the edge. Well, anyway, so what I was getting to is telling you that it may not be this simple. Because I've said, oh, well, your brain just has to watch how far it's accelerating. How big is the angular acceleration and get back under it, right? Okay, well, watch this. Right? You can do it with your eyes closed, right? I don't need to see the angular acceleration. But this, eyes closed doesn't help. Right? So it doesn't matter. So it's not just that you can see the angular acceleration. I think it's also that this is heavier, and you can actually feel it tilt over. So it does have to do with alpha, but I think it's more how the the forces are being applied to your hand. As it falls this way, I can kind of feel that with my hand. And it falls this way, I can kind of feel that with my hand. Right? So some bioscience people can tell me if this is actually important, or some kinesiology people. Because right? I don't know anything about biology. Okay. Let's see. I do have, let's see, I came up with another interesting bioscience question I ran across, or my kid told me, is if you see an endangered animal eating an endangered plant, what are you supposed to do about it? That's like a legitimate bioscience question. If I were teaching bioc here, that would be like question number one. It's like bioethics. Okay. Okay, so one more topic we need to cover is how to calculate the moment of something a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we won't go back to that one. Good questions. Come to office hours. We'll figure it out. Somebody asked about that Greek swirly letter. I don't know. I think you might mean the alpha, angular acceleration. Okay, there's one more thing. What if this happens? You want I, um, but not through the center. This is on your homework, actually. There's one like this on the homework, and I think it'd be fair game for the exam, because you don't have to do calculus to get there. 
But say we have a disk like this. Right, here's a disk, radius r, okay? And uh, we know this, the moment of inertia around that, right? I around this axis, one half mr squared. It's on your formula list. You're good at things on your formula list, okay? But what if I want to rotate around this axis? Ah, uh, I equals what? Okay, so there is a simple formula that will help you see the moment of inertia around other axes, okay? It's called the parallel axis theorem. Not around any axis, but around certain axes. And it's a theorem, but don't be afraid. It's not, we're not going to prove it. Um, so parallel axis theorem basically says, uh, well, let's just write it. <laughs> the moment around the parallel axis, right? This is the parallel axis. Um, and this is the center of mass axis, right? Because this symmetric axis that you know goes through the center of mass of the disk. Where is the center of mass of the disk? It's in the center, right? It's a uniform disk, it's a circle. We said usually for uniform symmetric things, it's in the middle. So if you can come up with an axis parallel to one that goes through the center of mass where you know the value, then you use this. The moment around the parallel axis equals the moment around the center of mass axis plus the total mass times the distance squared, okay, where the distance is between the two axes. Okay, so let's label all these. This is the moment, moment, and I'll tell you the tricks, around parallel axis. That's that one. This is the moment around the COM, and I'm going to put in parentheses, from the table, okay? <laughs> That's the one from the table. You look it up, and you see the line going through the center of the disk, and oh, it's one half ml squared, mr squared, just like he said. And this is simply the mass times the axis to axis distance squared. That looks horrible, okay? So you may look at this and say, why didn't you call this R? Like, this is a confusing thing. You'd say, well, if I put this here, or you might even see it written in some books as I parallel equals I center of mass plus MR squared. But there they're saying R is a distance between these axes. It doesn't have to be equal to the radius of the disk. If you put your rotation axis on the edge of the disk, which you often do because you usually have to be touching it to have something pull it around, you often do end up with an R there. Like in this problem, the way I drew it. Let's calculate it then. So I here, let's go ahead and calculate it. It is the center of mass value, one half m r squared plus m d squared, but in this case d is r, because I'm on the edge, r squared. I'm gonna put edge in parentheses there with an exclamation point. That's the reason that's R and not D. In every problem you do, that won't always be the radius of a disk. It might be anything. It could be anything. I could have asked you, what's the rotation of this about this axis way around here? And you just put in a meter. Right? But in this case, if you're on the edge of the disk, then it's just 3 halves mr squared. And that's it. 3 halves mr squared is the answer. So you can do that for a sphere. If this had been a sphere, you just put 2 fifths mr squared here. And you'd be the same distance from the center of the sphere. Right? So the distance between this axis and the axis of the center of mass. Okay? So that's something we use. That's important in rolling motion of a wheel, which maybe we'll get to next week, or we're going to cover that more when we do energy. We'll do rolling more when we do energy. But you can imagine, if you're thinking about how a wheel rolls, we said, you know, in the lab frame, in the real frame, it's rotating around the bottom of the wheel. It's, not, it's rotating around the center in the translating frame. But if we're talking the lab frame calculation, it's rotating around this axis. And that's exactly what this is, right? That's the moment for going around the edge of the radius, okay? Okay. So then our final topic, oh, we can do it real quick. Oh, we have plenty of time. Plenty of time for the final topic is, and really we've sort of been doing it, is just statics, okay? So we did a dynamics problem. We did um, the... Uh, Massive Atwood machine. I've got a couple more. I'll probably do them as videos, especially since we've had less exposure to this stuff. 
the survey is going to ask you, what video do you want to see? And it has to be, you know, physics stuff. No dancing or karaoke. Um, but one thing I want to point out that's different, and it's sort of a different style of problem, is static problems. It sounds like they would be easier, but they really aren't always easier. All static problems means is we did them a little bit with forces. It meant the sum of the forces in the x equals 0 and the sum of the forces in the y equals 0. So it's not moving. Now we're just going to add that the sum of the torques equals 0. It's also not rotating. right? If it's not moving, it's not rotating. Um, but we have a special superpower for rotational static problems, and that is we can put the axis anywhere we want. Right? So if you say it's static about this axis, well, it's also static about this axis, and it's static about that axis. So you can build up all the formulas you want by saying this is true. A lot of them might be not giving you new information, but the way you pick them can actually help you out quite a bit. Oh, plenty of time. So let's do the famous ladder problem. Oh, yes. Here we go. So you got a ladder at like 60, de oh, 60 degrees like that. Here's a ladder. It's against the wall here. Right. Ladder, this wall is, uh, oh, this is an ice wall. This is frictionless. Ooh. So this is a frictionless wall here. So there's no friction force on the ladder here. This has a static friction mu s down here. So if you think about it, if they were both frictionless, the, the ladder would fall. Right? We don't want to do that. But if only one of them is frictionless, uh, if only the top is frictionless, that just makes the problem easier. And the question in this problem is, um, what mu s to keep the ladder from falling? And we don't really have time to do it in perfect, clear detail, so I'll video it, but let's just get it started. Let's get the important concepts going. Okay? First important concept would be to label all the forces. We don't do as many free body diagrams now because we're thinking about the size of an object. But the forces, oh, there's always that one. Okay? If you're in the exam and you have no idea what to do on a problem, there's 30 seconds left, you didn't do a whole free response, just draw whatever shape and put like MG with an arrow down in the middle of it. Okay? You'll get a point, right? You'll get a point. So MG down this way, uh, the normal force this way, I'll call that N2. And the normal force is going to be up that way. We'll call that N1. And then there can be friction here. And remember, static friction fights the pent-up desire for motion. Which way does this thing want to go? If this were frictionless, it'd go that way. So static friction is that way, Fs. Right? So we have four forces to deal with. Normally, there'd be a static friction up here, because the pent-up desire to move is down. But we said this is frictionless to make the problem you know, doable. Okay. So that's the question. So what we would do then is to start to say, um, is to just start to write the sum of the forces in the x, sum of the forces in the y, and the sum of the torques, right? So in the x, all we have is uh, N2, we're going to do magnitudes, minus Fs equals what? Zero. This is a static problem. This is the, e, the, the good part about static problems. Zero. There's the x. Right? That's the x direction. Let's do the y. Oh, it's not so bad. N1 up minus mg down. It's not moving in the y. Okay. And now, here's the big one, and I'll just tell you. Now you've got to pick where you're going to do the torque. You've got to pick your axis for the torque. And I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to make a video of it so you all can think about it. Or if I get busy, I'll do it Tuesday. So where would you, which axis would be the wisest choice? Mystery for the ages. 